Um, Our reading this morning is um, from Luke chapter 11. And in the church Bibles it's 1042. That's Luke 11, 1 to 14. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing set before him. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me, the door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread, because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? If you then, though, are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Thank you, Betty, for your prayers, and thank you, Wendy, for your reading. In setting this passage this morning, God has a sense of humour, and I'll tell you why a little bit later. If you have the passage open in front of you, we're going to have a a quick look at the passage and explore it a bit. Then I want to talk about how this works out in our daily lives. As the saying goes, let's get real. I want to be real this morning about how, how it is for us how it is for us when we come to pray. So let's look at the passage. The disciples had just seen Jesus praying, and they wanted to learn how to do it. Now this is good, isn't it? That You see somebody doing something that's good, and then you want to learn how to do it. Uh, That's a good model to follow. And of course, Jesus is a great example to follow. So the disciples were right on track there. Also in those days, um, other religious communities had their own prayers which identified them. And the disciples in this new religious community were keen to have one too. So when Jesus says, when you pray, the you is plural. He's talking to them as a group, and his prayer is designed as their community prayer. And as such, it's our community prayer too. And we should pray it together regularly in our services, in our home groups, as well as on our own. Um, They're in school assemblies that are still praying the Lord's Prayer together, praying it together with Christians around the world as we did earlier. Jesus expected his disciples to use these words, and it's fine for us to use them too, or or words that are similar, and we can use them straight from the Bible. This is the prayer that Jesus taught. We're not going to go into a lot of detail on the Lord's Prayer because many of you will have studied it. Maybe in your home groups there have been sermon series on it. And indeed, a sermon series on the Lord's Prayer could last for weeks and weeks and weeks. And we haven't got weeks and weeks and weeks. But the Lord's Prayer can also be a useful template for our more specific prayers. We can use it line by line to inform our prayers. And indeed, in the reading... Um, the teaching goes on to to be more specific. It talks about a man who needed bread when some guests arrived. He needed the bread to feed his guests. Uh, That was culturally what he had to do, really. It was was important. It wasn't just a a, a little, oh, I need a bit of bread, knocking on the neighbor's door for a cup of sugar. It was vital for his relationship with his guests. And he was persistent. The man in the story was irritated, and he eventually gave in and gave the bread. 
But God doesn't answer our prayers because we irritate him. The point is, is that if the man will answer his neighbour even though he's irritated, how much more will God, who loves us, answer our prayers when we keep coming to him, seeking God's kingdom first rather than just bringing our shopping list? So in these verses, we see that God expects us to be specific, to be persistent, and to seek him above all else. Elsewhere in the Bible, there are also guidelines which teach us how we should pray. I'm not going to give you all the references. You can ask me for the individual references afterwards if you want to. Quite a few of them can be found in John's Gospel. You can read them for yourself. But I am going to read some of the verses. So today's reading was persistence and seeking God's kingdom first and being specific. Then there's a reading says, that says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. And that ties up, doesn't it, with thy will be done. We need to pray according to God's will. We need to faith and could, should, um, we need to confess doubt. We need to have faith and confess doubt. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. But we actually only need faith as big as a mustard seed. There's the well-known verse, Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. We know, don't we, that sin can get in the way of our relationship with God. And it says in James, Therefore confess your sins to each other, and pray for each other, so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So when we're praying, we need to make sure that there's nothing blocking our relationship with God. We need to ask in Jesus' name. Often our prayers end, don't they, in, in the name of Jesus. So we ask this in Jesus' name. And it says in John 16, Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete remain in Jesus. We have to stay in that relationship with him. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And Jesus also calls us to be obedient, to have that obedient relationship. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. We need to pray that when we're praying, we're praying with the right motives. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And then we know, don't we, there's that really well-known one, that we need to pray with other people. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. And when people are sick, and we do do this in this church, is anyone among you ill? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they'll be forgiven. And there's similar verses in the Old Testament as well. Very well-known one. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and will heal their land. We can see from these verses that God's very keen to hear our prayers and to answer them. These are promises which should encourage us, giving us hope and growing our faith, and also promises we can use to encourage each other. But God isn't just like a blank checkbook. And you can see from these verses that there are quite a lot of conditions attached to the promises. There are quite a lot of ifs. And it can begin to look a bit like a tick box, tick box exercise. If you can tick all the boxes, then you can guarantee that your prayers will be answered. Is that how it is? Is that how prayer is? Is it a tick box exercise? Does God really demand that we comply with all the conditions before he will answer our prayers? Is that the sort of God we know and love? 
What happens? We've done our best to tick the boxes and our prayers still go unanswered. How does this work out in our daily lives as we bring our prayers to God? As I said, I want to get real this morning because although we know that God is good, most of us have experience of unanswered prayer. Now when I started, I said that God had a sense of humour. I'd been asked to speak today. I didn't know what the reading was. The reading was coming along a bit later. And when I saw the passage I'd been given to speak on, when I laughed out loud and I actually said, oh, for goodness sake. Brendan and I have been attending something called Community Bible Study for the past couple of years. And since last September, we've been looking at the Gospel of Mark and the books of 1, 2, and 3, John and Jude. It's been very good, and we've learned a lot. But for me, there were times when, as we were looking at a Bible passage together, I'd interrupt the leader and say, hold on a minute, don't just skip over that bit. And at this point, our leader, Hu Chendu, who's absolutely great, would put on his interested but concerned face, but underneath he'd be thinking, oh no, here she goes again. So I was struggling with some of the passages that I read out above. It says in Mark 11, this is one of the passages we were studying, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And what does that mean? How does that work out in practice? How much belief do I have to whip up, or do I have to whip it up at all? And then in 1 John it says, Dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence and we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that please him. How obedient do we have to be before we receive whatever we ask for? If it's total obedience, then I'm scuppered. There's no chance. I don't know about you, whether you feel that as well. Believe me, our leader at these evenings, he's very good and he did his best. And we did explore it together. But it's something that I personally had sort of struggled with. And so it caused me, when I thought I was down to speak on this passage, to look more closely at some of the passages and the whole subject of answered and unanswered prayers. And that's really typical of God, isn't it? He often gives you more of the very thing that you're struggling with so that you learn. And my struggles with this passage, these passages, have come out of a friend's experience over the last couple of years. She has suffered a devastating blow in her life. She's a Christian, and so turned to God for help. She's persisted in prayer. She had total faith that God would change the situation. She prayed with other people. She's tried to be obedient. And we know that her prayers are totally consistent with God's will in this situation. In fact, she's just about ticked every box. But the situation has got worse rather than better, and her life is disintegrating. Her faith has been tested, and at one point when I visited her, her comment to me was, God is no more powerful than my feeble old dad in the nursing home. And as I drove away from visiting her that day, I have to say, I said out loud in the car, she has a very good point, God. But many of us here today, and me included, can give testimony to answered prayer. Some everyday mundane issues, like, Lord, I just need a parking space near the Debenhams end. Uh, And, you know, they get answered, don't they? And some totally miraculous answers to prayer, and I can give testimony to that, and I know many, many people can do that as well. And we really need to encourage each other uh, with those answers to prayer, to see what God has done in our lives, to share, to build faith, and to encourage But I know there are some, and perhaps many of us, who have also been praying diligently for God to work in a particular situation and have not yet seen a breakthrough. On the one hand, we believe the words we read in our Bibles to be inspired by God and to be true. We believe in a God who keeps his promises, who answers prayer. But on the other hand, we are just not seeing him work in our situations. How do we reconcile the two sides. Before we continue, there are just three things I want to mention that can help us to understand what's going on. The apparent gap between God's promises in the Bible and the times when our prayers are not answered. Firstly, there's always the point that many of us learned when we were first discovering about prayer. 
God says yes, no, and not yet. Sometimes what we ask for isn't good for us. Sometimes the timing isn't right and it's going to be later. And there's a lot of truth in this very simple statement. But that's part of the problem. It can be too simplistic when you are struggling to understand what God is doing or not doing. It may be like the man in the story today, you have to be persistent, but the cry can go on, can go on how long, Lord? Secondly, we do have to look at the context of the verses we're looking at. We need to look at who the verses are speaking to. What is the wider message in the passage? And what is the literary and historical context? An example of this is on the final verses in today's reading, which was from Luke. But if we read the parallel verse in Matthew's Gospel, it says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to good give, good give, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? But if we go back to the reading complimentary verse in Luke, it finishes off with, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So this verse is speaking very specifically about the gift of the Holy Spirit, and it's not about a Christmas present list. So we need to look at the context. Has there ever in the whole of history been a mountain moved as a result of someone's prayers? We need to understand the language used and the purpose of the teaching. Thirdly, however fervent our prayers, God will not overrule his principle of free will. If our prayers involve changing the mind of someone else, well, God can work wonders. He can arrange circumstances to bring people to their senses or create those God incidences that change people's minds. He can even speak to them directly. But he will not, although he could, make someone do something. That's not to say we shouldn't keep praying. Many, many people have seen change in miraculous ways as a result of prayer. I think you've probably got testimony where you've been praying for someone and they've become a Christian or, or whatever. So those are three things you just need to bear in mind when we're looking at these passages. So I believe wholeheartedly that God's promises are just that. They are promises. They're promises. So how do we reconcile the word of God with our personal experience of unanswered prayer? But not alone in our experience of unanswered prayer, there are plenty of examples in the Bible. You've only got to look at the Psalms to see that the writers frequently railed at God for not hearing or answering their prayers. It shows us it's okay to be real and even angry with God. But usually they came around to declaring their trust in God and praising his name. In the New Testament, Paul, who surely must have ticked all the boxes, prayed three times for the thorn in his flesh to be removed. You can read about it in 2 Corinthians 12. God didn't do it. But Paul learned through this experience that it was when he was weak that God was strong and that God's grace was sufficient. And even Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that God would find a way for him to avoid having to go to the cross. But in the end, he was more concerned with God's will and his own physical situation. So what's the key to holding in our daily lives and our prayer lives the tension that exists between God's promises about prayer and our experience of sometimes not seeing those promises fulfilled? And I believe that the way forward is to understand first and foremost that God loves us unconditionally and he wants a relationship with us. He doesn't expect perfection, he demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God is after a relationship with us, first and foremost. It's what we were made for, it's what we are created for. The picture shows a, a small child holding the hand of his father. And that's a picture, I believe, of our relationship with God. And so it's helpful when it comes to unanswered prayer. The child trusts the father to lead them. They don't always know where they're going. And sometimes where they're going isn't very nice. They might be going to the dentist. They might be going to the hospital. <laughs> uh, but we know that it's for their good. The child won't always understand what is happening. 
and certainly won't always get what it wants, but the relationship is solid. The father wants to talk with the child and to have the child talk with him, sharing joys and sadness, hopes and dreams, needs and feelings and love. It's a reflection of what we read in the Bible as the people have come to understand that their relationship with God is more important than anything else. In the book of Job, Job says during all his terrible struggles, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. And then he says, surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Then there's the well-known verse, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And then there's Isaiah's words of wisdom. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So when God doesn't seem to be answering our prayers, do we give up? Absolutely not. Prayer is all through the Bible, right from Genesis to Revelation. It's vital. It's like the air that we breathe that keeps our relationship with God alive. In Philippians, Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, it's easy to trust God when things are going the way we want. When things are going the way we want, it's easy to say, I'm trusting God for this, because you can see what he's doing. But it's not so easy, is it, when you can't see what he's doing. And we need to learn to trust God when we don't understand what he's doing. And that's quite a, a, a mark of maturity as you come to that place. You know, I just don't know what you're doing, God, but I'm going to trust you. And it's also important that we wrestle with the scriptures, either until we understand them, or we accept that we don't understand them, knowing that God is sovereign and can be trusted. What we don't do is say the Bible isn't to be believed. And then we need to ask God how to pray. It's what the disciples did, and it's where we started this morning. Now, some here today have been praying for God's um, promise that he's gave, given them for years and they haven't seen it come to fulfilment. There'll be some who've been praying for a particular thing and have not yet seen your prayers answered. There are some here today who have prayed and prayed for a situation which is not now going to be resolved. And I can uh, you know, give an example of that, that uh, 20 years ago my best friend died of breast cancer, leaving two small children the exact same age as, as my two. We prayed and prayed. She was a Christian leader in the church. We prayed and prayed. We did, we did all the praying together. We prayed in our groups. We prayed in churches. We called the old elders. But she died, leaving two young children. Some have been hurt by being told their prayers haven't been answered because you don't have enough faith. There was a time, um, probably about 10, 10 or 15 years ago, there was a sort of a name it and claim it theology that if you believed and if you claimed it, it was yours. Others called it victorious living, that it was all dependent on the amount of faith that you had. And this is so damaging. This can be so damaging when people have prayed faithfully and then somebody tells them they haven't got enough faith. For some, the, the fact that their prayers are not seeing their prayers answered means that they're, they're struggling with their faith. It's causing a difficulty in their relationship with God. They're ticking the boxes, but God just seems to be silent. And some have seen prayers go unanswered in the past and are now struggling with, a, with something to, they're praying for and, and are wondering, you know, if God didn't answer it in the past, do I, what, what's happening now? Do I carry on praying? Maybe disappointed with God. I'm just going to ask you after the service... If you'd like prayer with any of those things, if you're struggling with prayer, if you've been praying for something, if you think God has promised you something, then come forward and have somebody encourage you. Come and meet with the God who loves you so much. Come and put your hand in his hand and learn to trust him in, in whatever situation is, knowing that he loves you unconditionally. Whatever your circumstances, God loves you. 
He longs to hear your prayers. We need to keep praying. But just come and put your hand in his hand.